ready. Oh. Hello. Hi, Sophia. Okay, How are you? Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, host um, our own Noriko Iwasaki and Keiko Yoshioka's uh, talk about the use of mimetics and gesture among speakers of Japanese as a second language. And I know that another chorus is finishing early, so they come in. So don't get distracted if suddenly a lot of people walk in. Um, so thank you very much. And I'm really excited to hear about mimetics and gesture. So. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mandana. OK, so do you, know, do you all know what mimetics are? There are some uh, different names to refer to the same type of words. So, it's, uh, so in, in English, typically it's called onomatopoeia, but onomatopoeia is associated with those words that refer to sound. But Japanese mimetics, as, as well as it, so-called idiophones and expressives, can refer to many other things and um, sen uh, other words of sensation. And uh, so uh, it's, it is said that the mimetics uh, evoke vivid at the scene image and the native speakers have the intuition about uh, that sound mimetic relationship is not arbitrary, but they have some mi uh, relations. And, uh, and uh, Dif Diflos said that the meaning of mimetics is different from meaning of other words. It's an expressive mode of meaning. So just wanted to demonstrate the type of images that we associate with some of the mimetic words. There are a few mimetic words. This is a poster um, uh, of an event that I'm going to participate in January. But uh, so, it, so there are one, two, three, four, five, six words here, and the seventh word there. And so each word is written in such a way that the, each word the kind of images each word evokes. So this is, for example, uh, Heart throbbing or, and, and, or shock, shocking and so forth. So, so that's how uh, you know native speakers think of mimetics, some, something that evokes image and the uh, feeling. And uh, but it, uh, so I just want to introduce the, you know the the place of mimetics mimetics in the in the Japanese uh, in linguistics in Japanese language. So in Japanese there are four types of uh, lexicon, and uh, we have native Japanese words and long words, and native Japanese words are most restricted um, in terms of phonotactics. And the long words is more freer, they can you know, use type of sound that, that are not used, that are used in other words. But these, these words, Sino-Japanese words and mimetics are somewhere in between. So there are some sounds such as bilabial stop, uh, the voiceless by poo sound, uh, is, can be the initial, um, uh, can appear at the in, uh, word initial position, which is not the case with native Japanese words at all. So, so there's some uh, you know, uh, restriction to it, but uh, it's di so different from native Japanese words or long words. And it, within the mimetics, uh, they, are, um, they, uh, they are typically divided into three types of mimetics, depending on what they refer to. So phonomimes are the ones that refer to sound. But uh, phenomimes refer to more visual, tactile, or you know, other sensation. And mana is also um, o often described by phonomimes. And also psychomimes that uh, refer to, to psychological state, pain, and also emotion. So as you see, that, that's very different from you know, what you think of as, um, I mean, uh, when you hear onomatopoeia, onomatopoeia, then you don't think of these type of words, probably. And uh, so uh, they also have this uh, structure, more ph ph phonological uh, structures. And uh, basically, there are two types of roots to, to mimetics, uh, Japanese mimetics. One is CV, co consonant verb, and just one syllable. The other one has a, what other root is uh, uh, two, two moras, two syllables. It has two syllables, and that can be, you know, there are variations in which um, the, so the, by, by colon, I mean that they can be lengthened. So length, uh, it, when it's lengthened, it, has, it is associated with a longer sound, longer action. So it has meaning, this length. And, uh, and also, if it's uh, reduplicate, it's a probably repetitive uh, action and so forth. So, so the form of the word does have meaning. And uh, this uh, very typical um, part of uh, Japanese mimetics, morec nasal is, uh, tend to have, I mean, uh, suggest the, uh, the direction of motion, the quality of sound changes, lingering effect, that they call it. Or 
the geminate uh, cap is all often, so this um, notation is often used uh, to transcribe ro romanized Japanese mimetics, so uh, morek nasal and also geminate. And geminate uh, suggests um, that the action is carried out vigorously, very quickly, and so forth. And but I, I'll give you some example because you know, if looking at this does not tell you much. But for example, but so it can be. So I borrowed, uh, uh, I mean, the definition from Kakehi Edo's dictionary. It's a very uh, comprehensive dictionary of Japanese mimetics. So ba refers to the mana. So m uh, refers to mana, mana of something occurring or being done suddenly and with vigor. So it doesn't continue. It's a very quick motion, a quick, quick action of some kind. But ban, on the other hand, uh, it refers to sound, a single loud sound. So, so actually, this uh, voice, uh, voice sound is associated with the loudness and, and the heaviness and the big, uh, the big size. And, uh, and caused by explosion or, and, and, uh, and with some lingering uh, sound, uh, resonant, resonant sound. And, uh, but on the other hand, so that's a, that, that root is CV. It, uh, B and uh, ba uh, is a root. And uh, on the other hand, there's lots of also uh, roots with the two syllables, or we call, uh, in, in Japanese, um, maybe it's better to call them uh, two moras, but uh, uh, goro. So this, uh, this is a short, short rambling sound, or the manner of rolling briefly, just briefly, it's because it's short. And, uh, and goron, on the other hand, uh, so although, you know, uh, uh, Morek nasal and uh, geminate I think, uh, are supposed to have a different meaning. This, in dictionary, they didn't bother to try to distinguish between these two. But uh, if you are a Japanese speaker, you might sense a bit of a difference between gorot and goron. So it's a more lingering goron in case of um, goron. And here, and also in terms of the, the uh, grammatical class, uh, it, they are more quite versatile. So for example, because I gave an example of uh, goro and goron, I have um, koro koro as, a, as, a, uh, ko, uh, as an example. So koro koro is an adverb, and uh, so it rolled koro koro. I didn't even bother to translate it. But anyway, <laughs> so which, what that means is that, so k means it's a, you know, a voiceless consonant, meaning it's a light thing that is rolling. It's, it's not goro goro, so it's a light thing. And it's a smooth rolling, a repetitive uh, rolling, uh, ro rolling. So that's koro koro. And, uh, but you, you notice, maybe I mentioned a little bit. So koronda is a verb korobu. So in Japanese, sometimes they talk about how some of the verbs might have stems, you know, originated from, from mimetics because they look similar, don't they? And, uh, you know, koro koro and koronda, a Japanese verb uh, for to, to refer to rolling. And, and sometimes it can be adjectival now, koro koro no kodomo, but this usage might, be not, might not be so common nowadays, but uh, um, koro koro no kodomo or koro koro shita kodomo. So it can be a verb. Shita suru is a light verb, and uh, so mimetic can be uh, easily changed into a mimetic verb by adding a light verb. So it's very versatile in terms of grammatical class. So it's a very interesting class of words. And in terms of semantics of mimetics, um, so I already mentioned that it has expressive mode of meaning, so quite different from other types of words. And uh, so Kita proposed that uh, actually there's two dimensions of meaning, and, uh, uh, and one is an uh, affect imagistic dimension and, uh, in which mimetics uh, belong to, mimetics meanings belong to, and all the other words are in uh, meaning of all the other words in analytic dimension. And uh, so they, uh, and, and he uh, so, uh, provided some evidence, although some of the evidence was kind of que uh, questioned by some other researchers, but uh, he, uh, one of the evidence that he, he gave was the tight coupling of mimetics and paralinguistic phenomena, such as expressive prosody. And so what we are going to look at is the coupling of uh, mimetics and gesture. So, so one of the evidence that one of, one piece of evidence that uh, uh, Kita provided to sh to say that uh, mimetics has a uh, meanings of mimetics is uh, in a very different dimension, imagistic and affective. So Kita uh, in Kita's study, um, although he didn't have many participants, but uh, um, they, he found that almost all the mimetics are accompanied by by stroke, uh, that is a, meaning, a meaningful phrase of gesture. And uh, 
and uh, he found that uh, compared to verbs, mimetics were 90 of the, 94 percent of the time accompanied by uh, iconic gesture. So the questions uh, that arise, uh, for example, are you know, whether L2 speakers, I mean, those people who use Japanese as a second language, but also uh, use gesture when you use, uh, they, they use mimetics. And uh, does it depend on the proficiency, Japanese language proficiency or not, is another question. But before we go on, on um, ah, so this is another piece of evidence, but maybe we'll skip it because I have lots of slides. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway. And, uh, but uh, before we, I, I talk about uh, you know, the second language acquisition of mimetics, uh, I want to note that it, it's recognized that these words are very important uh, for second language learners as well. Um, so educators uh, talk about how vital this class of words are in Japanese. And we have a large inventory of these words. So one of the dictionaries that I have has 4,500 mimetics listed in the dictionary, for example. And there's lots of mimetics specific dictionaries as well. So it's, these, these are important classes of words. And in, in terms of the first language acquisition research, research on first language acquisition, it is known that the, um, the three-year-old learn meaning of novel action in, by experiment. Uh, they found that the, um, if the words have some si sound symbolic uh, elements, meaning the kind of elements that are uh, contained in mimetics, then the, the children can learn these novel words uh, more quickly, more easily. And uh, in terms of uh, the research on natural development, I mean development of infant's language, they found that the children tend to use creative, innovative mimetic words first, and then later on, they would start using lexicalized, more established mimetic words. And on the other hand, in terms of the meaning, uh, domain, semantic domains of mimetic words, young children tend to start using mimetics that refer to sound. And then later on, they would they use other uh, mimetics of other dom semantic domains. So that's what has been found among little children, three-year-old infants. And how about second language learners? Uh, so there's lots of anecdotes about how second language learners have difficulty with these mimetic words. I mean, there are, I see some people who, are, who have learned Japanese as a second language here. But uh, so, so there, are, there are more anecdotes, anecdotes, but recently there are some experimental studies as well. And, uh, but in my study, so I didn't study the acquisition itself, but what I did was that um, I presented all the audio stimuli of the Japanese mimetic words to English speakers who haven't studied Japanese at all before and uh, asked them to, to guess the meaning of these words by rating it on the semantic dimensions. Like if uh, they are the words referring to manner of walking, is it big strides, small strides, or with a bit louder sound or uh, softer sounds, so that sort of dimensions uh, the, uh, had to be rated by the, the participants. And also I used um, the other mimetic uh, dim, uh, semant semantic domains uh, that I studied were uh, so um, mimetics, uh, mimetics referring to manner of walking, mimetics uh, referring to, to, to laughter, manner of laughter. But manner of laughter has something to do with the, the, the voice of laughter as well, but manner of laughter and also type of pain. But for each of these mimetic words, um, mimetics, the those speakers who, have, uh, who haven't studied Japanese, those English speakers who haven't studied Japanese at all before, have some ideas about what mimetics suggest. Like the uh, vowel R is associated with the uh, large, I mean, big strides, and uh, larger laughter, louder laughter, and so forth. So that's something that they could know. Uh, but so from there, you could, you might think that it's not, uh, it's easy for, for L2 learners to acquire mimetics, Japanese mimetics, because they have, they have some uh, you know, knowledge of sound symbolism already. However, some studies that are conducted have always shown that, in fact, it's quite difficult for second language learners to, to understand which mimetics to use for each context, I mean, the, for a given context. So the other question, uh, so, the, so, so far, mimetics appear, appear to be quite difficult for L2 speakers of Japanese. And uh, another question is that, is it different from other words? 
And uh, so as I mentioned that they, so uh, uh, Kita, for example, uh, considers, I mean, uh, cl claims that the mimetics have, the meaning of mimetics is com quite different from the, the uh, semantics of the other words. And uh, so it, it, it is uh, often uh, used with gesture, is one of the, uh, one piece of evidence that he provided. And also what's interesting is that, so if it's affective and uh, then it might be, the pattern might be similar to, to, the, to the acquisition of emotion words. So the emotion words have been studied um, in second language acquisition. Um, and uh, they found that uh, unlike the other words, something like personality affects uh, the frequency of, I mean, the use of these words, uh, emotion words. For example, extroverts use more emotion, uh, emotion words uh, according to uh, du Duval, Duval and Pavlenko. So maybe there's something similar to the use of mimetics as well. Okay, so uh, I want to introduce a few uh, previous studies, uh, including ours. So Yoshioka, my co-author, uh, she unfortunately couldn't come today, um, studied one um, Dutch speaker across four years and uh, collected data at three points. He didn't use so many um, mimetics, but uh, uh, so at first when he was uh, you know, elementary level speaker, he, he didn't use any, but then he, uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, at, the la at the final point, he used seven mimetics, hom homo more homophones than phenomimes, uh, uh, more phonomimes, uh, like si sound mimetics, than um, phenomimes, uh, phenomimes, phenomimes that uh, refer to manner. And uh, so he, she found that the gesture frequency increases with proficiency. And she, she actually quite uh, cares about this uh, finding because it's not, gesture is not, uh, speakers, L2 speakers don't always use gestures to compensate for, for the lack of their uh, vocabulary knowledge is what's, uh, one of the claims that she, she makes. And, uh, and, but as, they, as he became more proficient, the skill to depict events icon iconically using both mimetics and gesture improved is what she found. And uh, so, uh, but one interesting question to ask is that we know that some languages have a lot of mimetics, such as Korean, and uh, some African languages also. And, uh, but some languages like English do not have many, um, I, I, many mimetic-like words. So um, does it affect their use of mimetics, Japanese mimetics as a second language? Okay, so I'll just keep, I mean, don't talk about this in detail, but uh, so, uh, so one of the studies I, did, I conducted is that, um, that my, so I tr tried to see if um, L2 Japanese speakers whose L1 is typologically similar, Korean, has an advantage in using Japanese mimetic words or not. So I looked at the uh, Corpus of uh, oh. sorry, object. Uh, uh, first of all, I wanted to introduce the similarity between the Korean mimetics and Japanese mimetics. So, although there are some differences, but there are some similarity in in uh, some mimetics, uh, Korean mimetics was and Japanese mimetic was. And uh, so, for example, uh, and also. Uh, I also gave the same uh, auditory and uh, stimuli to both Korean native speakers, monolingual Korean speakers and monolingual Japanese speakers. And the kind of words that they produce, mimetic words they produce, were also quite similar. And uh, some inventory, uh, if you look at this, you, you can see that uh, they have similar items um, in Korean and Japanese. And also in, in terms of grammar too, um, Korean and Japanese are similar in that the mimetics are often used as adverbs in, in Korean and in Japanese. But in English, the sound symbolic words, uh, the words that are similar to mimetics, words that are considered to be similar to mimetics, are used as a verb most of the time and sometimes as a, as a noun. So that's what has been uh, uh, reported. So I, I checked 
corpus to see if um, Koreans actually use more mimetics than uh, more Japanese mimetics than Korean speakers use more than English speakers in the corpus of oral proficiency interviews. Then I found, actually, English speakers use more more mimetics, and why? So, and. Uh, so altogether, the number of speakers who use mimetics was exactly the same, but the number of types and tokens, tokens uh, were more, I mean, uh, there were more mimetics used by English speakers. So we, we, we need to study them a little bit more, don't, don't we? And also, I checked, uh, I, I, I thought maybe I, I'll look at the same data again. Re I re revisited the data and see if at least Korean speakers might have used Japanese mimetics in a more, you know, um, varied contextual context or something, because they have mimetics that are similar in grammar as well. And as I mentioned earlier, Japanese mimetics are very versatile in terms of the way you can use it. Uh, uh, adverb, verbal, uh, verbs, or uh, even uh, nominals, I mean, adjectival nominals. But I didn't find that. So uh, one English speakers used more mimetics in more varied structure, structural contexts. And also, strangely enough, the highly proficient Korean speakers did not use many mimetics at all. And uh, but so that's what I found. But the problem with uh, the past studies that I just showed is that I said that the, the corpus included the oral pro proficiency interviews. So each speaker had a slightly, well, quite different types of um, questions. and. Uh, so they are not, they don't, didn't talk about the same thing. So we don't know uh, whether the smaller number of mimetics produced by Korean speakers was due to the type of topics that they were given. And, uh, and also, in, in, ca in case of Yosh Yoshoka, she did use the same, uh, fro do you know, frog story? It's a picture book without any word. She used that, and she used it across three times but then only one participant. So we don't know so much about whether. So he, this Dutch speaker used more uh, phono, phonomes, um, I mean, the so, sound, um, sound mimetics more than the, the other types of mimetics, but we don't know if that's the case with uh, you know, other speakers. Uh, so I, I, we think, I mean, it's important to elicit the use of mimetics from larger number of L2, L2 Japanese speakers and utilizing the same similar across all the participants. And, uh, uh, and I did one study with, uh, in which I examined only motion description. And as you, you, many of you may, uh, you, you know, uh, Tawuni uh, proposed this uh, uh, classification, um, th uh, classified the, the languages um, into, um, I mean, depending on how they, uh, how languages describe, lexicalize uh, the, um, the motion events. And English is uh, one of those uh, languages that are that is classified as satellite framed language. So in this language, path, path of motion is indicated by particles such as into and out, and verbs usually encode manner of motion. But uh, in languages such, uh, verb, uh, in verb framed languages, uh, verbs usually encode path rather than uh, manner. But this manner instead uh, in case of Japanese and Korean, is uh, elaborated by using, by using mimetics. So this is, uh, you know, typical examples. Um, like, uh, so in English, in English motion, um, the translocational motion and the manner is described by the verb and the path by the particle. And, uh, but in case of Japanese, this is uh, considered to be the typical way to describe manner of uh, 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 motion event. So mana is uh, described by a uh, adjunct phrase, um, rolling. And, uh, and then uh, the path, uh, path is described by the main verb. So I studied how English and Korean speakers uh, described manner of motion. Uh, uh, motion events. And uh, I, what I found is that um, there are some events that elicit a lot, of mo a, lot, a lot of mimetics. So that's one thing I found, regardless of um, the first language. So, and, uh, 
But however, Korean speakers use even more uh, mimetics. But what's interesting is that regardless of the first language, they also used uh, mimetics as verbs, despite the fact that the native speakers often use mimetics as an adverb to describe manner. But the type of semantics they seem to impose, Korean speakers and English speakers in, um, impose on these mimetic verbs, um, seem to be related to their first language. For example, this is uh, an English speaker. Koro 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 shite de sono shita ni saka ga arimashita. So, koro koro is uh, used as a verb, and it seems like it's a, you know, equivalent of English word uh, verb roll, meaning that uh, it refers to the uh, translocational motion as well as the manner. But in, uh, so maybe I'll just proceed to the Korean case. So, in this case, goro uh, goro shinagara or goro goro shite, so they have the main verbs that refer to, to path, path verbs. So what, uh, they, they are using the verbs like uh, rolling as an um, as a adjunct phrase to refer to mana. Um, so so that, simul that is similar to the ty uh, typological, um, uh, typological difference I, I found. Okay, so summary. Uh, so Korean speakers use more mimetic works, that, uh, mimetic words than English speakers, and um, uh, and uh, so that seemed to be related to their first language. So and so this is a uh, 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 background. So I, now I'm going to talk about today's. <laughs> so it, it has already been. Uh, <laughs> so so let's see. Uh, so. Finding so far, I, you know the finding so far, so I'll skip it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the current study examines the use of medical words and gesture by L2 Japanese speakers whose L1 is either English or Korean. The same participants who, who, which, who I examined for uh, motion, um, motion event description. And uh, so importantly, I picked the kind of videos that for which Japanese speakers do use mimetics and, uh, and so to see the influence of uh, first language and, and how they use gesture as well uh, along with mimetics. Okay, so I have two sets of, um, we have two sets of research questions. One is related to the frequency of mimetics and types of mimetics, um, sound mimetics or not. Um, so um, ph phonemes or uh, phenomenes. And if that's related to, prof uh, to, uh, to their proficiency. And the other uh, set of questions are related to gesture. So do they also use gesture when they do? So these L2 speakers also use gesture when they use mimetics? And also, is it Korean speakers who use more, uh, more gesture than if they, they, are, they have similar words in their first language? And uh, also, I mean, is there any difference between the way they use gesture um, uh, 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 compared to the way native speakers of Jap native Japan native speakers of Japanese use gesture is another the second question, and this is a, a you know uh, something that I was curious about. What kind of iconic gesture are we talking about if the word is referring to sound? If it's referring to manner of motion, sure you can iconically represent manner of motion by gesture. So that's what we wanted to look at too. Okay, so. Basically, uh, what I'm presenting today, I have different other types of instruments as well, but I'm re reporting on the description, description of video clips. So maybe you know about this Sylvester, so maybe I can just skip in the video clip. And uh, yeah, I don't you, I don't, you don't think so? Well, I know it in and out, but like, okay. there's another speaker so, that does Okay. So this is the, the event that elicited, elicited a lot of mimetics from both English speakers and, I mean, English speakers, not so many, but.
I made sure to buy a Japanese version of the, the cartoon. <laughs> and okay, so, and so, yes, um, Japanese, native speakers of Japanese use a lot of mimetics, uh, 17 out of 21 speakers. And uh, although I have to mention, there's a variety of mimetics. Mm -hmm. So they say that this is a correct mimetic, goro goro, but actually, kuru kuru, which is supposed to be not about rolling, but about rotating. Uh, kuru kuru and guru guru are, are also used by native speakers, I have to say. And, and, uh, and uh, also this uh, motion also uh, elicited a lot of mimetics. Pew, pew, <laughs> or something like that. And, uh, and uh, earthquake, this is only 10 seconds. Um, So that's, and uh, for this, uh, you know, Japanese speakers would use but, yusa yusa, or gata gata, ban ban. I thought yura yura would come up, but didn't come up. So there's something, what, you know, uh, yeah, the variety of mimetics um, that speakers use were actually quite different. Maybe it's have something to do with generation too. These are college students who describe the, the video clips. And uh, hurricane. Yeah, so that's, that's it. So for, for basa, za, ba, wa, bua, these, these are kind of mimetics they, they used. And the Japanese speakers, I mean. And I mean, L1 Japanese speakers. And uh, yeah, we had, um, ah, so uh, please note, I had more Korean speakers than English speakers. And, uh, and uh, I made sure that they were residing in the country of origin um, because it didn't affect the context affected. And, uh, and I checked their proficiency, the oral proficiency interview. And uh, so, um, so this is kind of, the, only Korean speakers had very high level, profi uh, um, very high, highly proficient speakers. But you know, English speakers still had, uh, some of them are advanced level. This, this uh, refers to advanced mid, uh, is uh, uh, the, 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 Levels that are um, defined by Act American Council of Foreign Language Teaching, and uh, but for gestures we looked at the subset uh, in parentheses. Okay, so I just want to note that the, the st students actually they describe the same event in English as well, but uh, in different orders. So sometimes uh, one might describe the uh, the earthquake in English first. Uh, but then other students might uh, first in, uh, uh, but the other students would describe it in other orders. Okay, so we looked at the, the type of uh, mimetics and uh, the decision. I mean, so, but actually we had three, we looked at, uh, we also consider, uh, so, so that some mimetics do refer to both um, the manner of motion and the sound at the same time. The example that I gave, pew, jumped pew. It's a bit about sound and also very straight, quick motion, manner as well. So that was uh, classified as both. Okay, and uh, for, for gesture, importantly, we picked, on, uh, we uh, analyzed only subsets of the events be this is because we wanted to compare mimetics and verbs with, with how frequently um, gestures occurred, but verbs that describe the same event rather than any random ver verbs. So to do that, uh, three events were um, uh, often described using both mimetics and verbs, so rolling and earthquake and hurricane. So we checked the rate of st stroke of gesture that accompanied uh, accompanies mimetic expressions or verbs, and uh, the rate of, rate of either the mimetic expression or the verb um, being the first word in the, uh, that synchronized with the gesture. So to give you an example, so this is, I, I promised anonymity to the participants, so you can't see the face, but 
アメもザーザー来て,来ていますそういう人ザーザーアンドザジェスチャーシンクロナイズドインディスケースゴロゴロマナーオフローリングゴロゴロねポリ,ポリング場まで行ってます By synchronized, we mean the clothes that contain、um, mimetic and, and the gesture. And in this case,、um, there's no mimetic, just verb. So, so the verb is actually a very generic verb, move. So, that's maybe something to do with the fact that they want to use. Um, mimetic, I mean, gesture. Okay, so here's the results. So, do they use, do English speakers use a lot of mimetics? Well, not so many, but they did use phonemes as well as phenomemes, and also the type of mimetics that you refer to both. And uh,、um, you see that、uh, maybe the intermediate bit type speakers might, might use the largest number of mimetics. Korean speakers,、uh, you, you already see here, there's no phonemes used by these speakers. These are intermediate low,、um, novice high, intermediate low, it,、uh, intermediate mid, intermediate high. And if you look at more higher proficient speakers, we had to do something about this speaker. <laughs> so, what this means is that she, she 29 tokens, but three types, meaning she used. One mimetic 26 times. <laughs> And pat. So it's like, run pat,、uh, jumped pat, so that, that, like that. So, but, so we had to exclude it. So, And、uh, so you see that altogether only two phono, phono, phonemes, but lots of phonemes. And so, but if you look at, if I, we exclude this、uh, participant who used a lot of Uh, 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 a lot of talk,、uh, tokens of pat, then the mean was exactly the same, four, four by.、Uh, so if I, that total number of mimetics、uh, tokens are divided by the number of participants, it's exactly the same. However, English speakers needed more encouragement. So actually, in this、uh, narrative, the speakers first gave the description of what they saw. Now, after that, the interviewer sometimes.、Uh, You mean, could you clarify that a little bit? Or something like that later on, after the first set of description. So, there,、uh, eventually, English speakers use,、uh, produce more mimetics, but at first,、uh, you know, if you look at the mean of the first description only, it's true that Korean speakers did use more, more mimetics. And、uh, so, if, when it comes to profici、uh, proficiency, as I briefly mentioned before, It's not necessarily the higher level speakers who use more mimetics, but it's the middle range. And it's more pronounced, this tend trend, tend tend trend is more pronounced for, for Korean speakers. Superior speaker is a very highly proficient speaker, but no mimetics whatsoever. And these advanced high level speakers didn't use many either, but intermediate level speakers use more mimetics. So, To, to answer the first set of questions,、um, if once we exclude the one participant, then the token means of English and Korean speakers were, were the same. But the Korean speakers did use more mimetics in the first description, so I think they are more inclined to use mimetics. But Korean speakers used phonemes most of the time and、uh, you know, very few、uh, phonemes, while English speakers often use phonemes as well. And、uh, so, yeah, I mentioned that high, higher proficiency speakers did not necessarily use more mimetics. So that's very different from other types of words, I think. And、uh, in terms of gesture, so this is、uh, coming from Kita's data. So,、um, so this, these are mimetics accompanied by gesture and verbs accompanied by gesture. And,、uh, Among L2 speakers of Japanese, too, whenever they use mimetics, 
their, uh, their use of mimetics is accompanied by gesture, most of the time, indeed. What's different is that L2 speakers also use gesture um, for verbs as well, but not to the same extent as, uh, as mimetics. So, uh, if, so it's just wanted to, to see if the, um, there's any difference in, it depends on, depending on the proficiency. And uh, so the, the pattern is a bit similar to, to the use of mimetics. Those people who use more mimetics tend to use more gesture. I mean, so uh, it's not surprising uh, considering the fact that the mimetics is accompanied by gesture. So... So it, the same is true with the uh, Korean speakers, although there are some. Um, this one person. So there. So so some of the means are not so meaningful because uh, this is just one person, for example. And uh, here six, but. Uh, okay, so we found that uh, I mean the last question uh, the, the about gesture is that how do do these speakers describe the sound by gesture? So there were two types. They, they, they just, uh, their gesture either depicted the action or the, the event that, uh, co that emitted the sound, or just uh, if it's a uh, loud sound, then like this. Uh, uh, so it's two-handed symmetrical gesture moving away from center. So that's what they used. So, uh, yes, uh, so these are the su summary. So the mimetics are nearly always, well, nearly always accompanied by, by gesture. So it's not, it's not lower proficient speakers who use more gesture. So gesture accompanied verbs, uh, gesture uh, accompanied verbs more frequently in L2 and we think that maybe they are trying to elaborate what they were saying by gesture. So the so example that I gave you earlier, the verb was move rather than roll. And then the gesture was suggesting some rotation or rolling. Okay, so um, here's a summary of um, results. So in terms of Frequency of use of mimetics and mimetic types. Korean speakers use more mimetics without uh, request for elaboration. And uh, Korean speakers primarily used uh, phenomimes, phenomimes. Um, and, uh, um, but English speakers use both types. Um, although the, uh, the phonomimes are not so frequent. And uh, interestingly, some of the lower proficiency English speakers only used phono phonomes. And uh, in terms of mimetics and gesture, both, both English speakers and Korean speakers used gesture when they used, used mimetics, and uh, uh, they synchronized with mimetics. The gest their gesture synchronized with mimetics. And uh, the both use of gesture and mimetics did not seem to depend on, there's no clear pattern related to profi their proficiency. If there is any, then you know, higher level proficiency speakers, for some reason, did not use many mimetics and not so many gesture, so, so much gesture either. And so we think one of the uh, possibilities that Korean speakers with very high proficiency uh, want to be really precise about their choice of mimetics. And that's probably uh, for, for, but to be precise in describing you know, this, uh, um, this affective, imagistic uh, meaning is quite challenging, so maybe they were avoiding it. Or another thing, uh, possibility is that um, because Korean is used, uh, Korean also, Korean, in Korean too, there are a lot of mimetics, and they know very well when to use mimetics, which register to use mimetics. Um, so maybe it's possible that uh, they want to be, uh, you know, proper and, and avoiding mimetics. And, uh, and what's interesting is that low, lower proficiency English speakers use of 
phonemes is a bit similar to the pattern that, that is observed among children. So it, maybe they are learning this set of words from scratch in a way, rather than compared to Korean speakers who already have a large set of similar type, uh, large set of words that are similar. And uh, in terms of gesture, regardless of one, core speech gesture accompany mimetics. Um, so maybe you know, the salient feature of mimetics um, is uh, you know, tend to ac be accompanied by, uh, by gesture. And also maybe this is uh, something that, uh, that is probably, um, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to say universal, but it's something shared across speakers of different languages maybe. And uh, uh, finally, um, like the use of other expressive or affective vocabulary, L2 use of medics seems to depend on the individual. So there's no clear pattern. Uh, okay, I, okay, so that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noriko. Questions? I was thinking of maybe the, um, the novelty of memetics, maybe for English speakers compared to Korean speakers, since Korean seems to have um, the same types of words, but um, for English speakers, it is kind of a new concept for them when they learn it. So do you think that can affect the usage of it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's an important point. And uh, in fact, in some second language acquisition research, novelty does matter. Mm. So yeah, I... I didn't include it here, but I definitely uh, you know, think about that too. Yeah. Yeah, no, because it's interesting to them. For Korean speakers, it's one of those words that are very difficult to, to be very precise about, or maybe. But novelty, yeah, I think yeah, I guess like, anecdotally I've noticed that people who learn another language, they seem to have a favorite word or favorite feature and they use it often once they learn how to use it properly. Yeah, but uh, I, I also think that uh, you know, when the, they are uh, intermediate level speakers, that's when they really you know, try out these uh, interesting type of vocabulary. And, and uh, it's possible that high proficient speakers, again, um, want to be more precise and want to select the, the exact mimetic that is more, I mean, the, the, the ones that are more suitable. Maybe that's why they are more, a bit more reserved. That's what I'm guessing. But uh, novelty definitely yeah, matters. Yes, Peter? I have two questions. Yes. Did you check if the participants were interested or had any familiarity with Mandarin? Did I check it? My mm. hypothesis being that mm -hmm. if you were interested in mm -hmm. Mandarin, then these, are, mm -hmm. these would be something you'd be keen on. Yeah, so, so ac actually, I didn't specifically check that, but one type of data set which I haven't quite um, analyzed is the interviews. So after they did all this, I asked each participant about mimetics, where they see mimetics and uh, you know, um, whether they, they like to use mimetics and such. So maybe they might have mentioned it if that's what they, um, I mean, they, they encounter mimetics often in, in manga. So I have to check that, yeah. And the second question is about teaching methods. Yeah. Um, I mean, mimetics in Japanese are genre-dependent as well, it seems to me. Um, and if you were taught Japanese using mainly written materials, mm -hmm. particularly correct mm -hmm. uh, materials, you mm -hmm. wouldn't be exposed to them very much. Actually, you Compared, will be. Let's say to you know, uh, conversational usage. Um, that, that's my hypothesis, whether it holds mm -hmm. up or not. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm no, both. Novels have lots of mimetics, actually, novels, short no, stories. I like newspapers and... Uh, no, newspapers don't, yeah, they don't, yeah. The sort of stuff that's typically mm. fed to, to, to language, or mm -hmm. was typically fed to language mm -hmm. learners, and the hypothesis would be that Korean, maybe in the teaching of Japanese to Korean speakers, they get a lot more of that sort of stuff rather than conversational narratives and, and so on, where mimetics turn up more. Mm. Is that worth investigating? Yeah, yeah may maybe, yeah, so, yeah, but it's very difficult to go back to these participants, so that's one thing that is difficult, but uh, yeah. But, but one thing that I note about the, tech, the material, teaching materials, 
they don't contextualize mimetics so much. They often use a, have a list of mimetics yeah. referring to pain. Yeah. And uh, when there's a situation, hospital situation, in a dialogue or something. So that um, might not help uh, L2 learners so much in terms of... Uh, yeah, I mean, just anecdotally, yeah. I remember when I was learning that we would never have it in, never, you wouldn't find them in class. Or they would tell you gata gata and you know, koro koro and so on. But it wasn't until you actually yeah. went to Japan and started using them that you heard with the context in which they were actually used. So. Yeah, so it's interesting to, to find whether being in Japan is, uh, uh, helps them to, to use these words or not. Mm. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yes, Hannah? Um, yeah, I had a, a question about, you made this point that, that English speakers, I think, um, need some encouragement maybe to kind of elaborate on their descriptions, and I wondered if you had any thoughts about what role that played, and it sort of links actually to the teaching idea, so whether they almost feel that they're being encouraged to use hmm. certain descriptive things that they've learned, or if you have any yeah, general feelings about that. Yeah, that's interesting, because... so. So Korean speakers were also encouraged to, to elaborate more, but they didn't use so many mimetics when they were uh, asked to elaborate. So they would say, so, so sometimes the interviewer said, what kind of noise? I mean, as if it was, you know, it, uh, you know um, it, it, it was almost as if she was trying to elicit mimetic, sound mimetic. But then the Korean speakers often said, very loud noise. <laughs> Or something like that, and but uh, English more more English speakers would say mm, like "pum" or something like that, and I don't know why that was the case. But uh, yeah, but English speakers uh, when they um, when, when are asked to elaborate uh, did come up with innovative mimetics, but not Korean speakers so much. Yes. We know from Kito and Azurek's work that English and Japanese speakers gesture differently about these kind of motion events with those videos. Um, and we know that people who gesture in their second language gesture somewhere between their first and second language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, like, mm -hmm. maybe with mm -hmm. English speakers are using more mm -hmm. memetics and they're also encoding more half and manner mm -hmm. in their gesture or something, mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there might be a, mm -hmm. yeah. not, just the, not mm -hmm. just the binary presence license mm -hmm. of the gesture, but the types of gesture. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are looking at the description of manner by gesture. And uh, so, and uh, we were comparing uh, the, this uh, description of manner, uh, gesture, uh, with uh, what was found by, I mean, compared with the uh, English native. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, go, go back and Brown has studied, uh, you know, English Japanese bilinguals in a different, uh, you know, Japanese speakers who have learned English as a second language. So we are trying to see if what they found, uh, um, is applicable. I mean, so we, we, uh, to those English speakers who have learned Japanese as a second language, and uh, so yeah, that's, that's um, you know ongoing. But uh, the data set is unfortunately not so large. But we are trying to see the type of um, whether they, they describe path and manner, and also we are looking at uh, whether what uh, Kita Kita said uh, about uh, some of the. Um, events like swinging, swinging, and uh, uh, conflation of motion, um, um, motion events like rolling, uh, is observed by uh, English speakers uh, who learn Japanese as a second language. Yeah, we are looking at that. Yeah. Yes. It would be interesting to actually to have a comparison with Italian speakers learning Japanese because. In Italian, you have way more. Yeah, it would be interesting, isn't it? Massive amount of times yeah. more. So. Yeah. So. You, you were saying Korean and, and English, but also Italian. Yeah, sounds interesting. Yeah. Yes? I think one of the issues to get around to address the issue of individual variation yeah. is 
with the, you need to like determine one of the questions is when they speak their L1 mm -hmm. and then compare that to when they speak their L2. So mm -hmm. it's a within and yeah. a between yeah. subject comparison. Yeah. Because one, one of the problems you have is the numbers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you have N1, it doesn't tell us anything about what they do at a specific mm -hmm. stage. Mm -hmm. You need a larger data set to be able to make mm -hmm. any generalization. So mm -hmm. I'm not so, but I'm actually not so interested in, I mean, I think it's really uh, varies among individuals, so. Well, this is, yeah, but to get across, I mean, when you're saying it depends on the individual, in order to get over the individual level, you need a larger data set. Because mm -hmm. the individual variation, yes, we know some people speak a lot, some speak, people speak a little, I mean, there is a lot of individual variation, but it's the, the end that gets you out of that problem. Mm -hmm. Right, of the use yeah. of certain kind of things. Right. That's the one thing. The other one is, so the when you did the experiment, the interlocutor was a confederate. Mm -hmm. So was it always the same? How many confederates did you have? For, for Japanese? For eliciting the data, yeah. For, yeah, for the, only one Japanese speaker. Yeah. yeah, so what that tells you is that you have you need to kind of control for mm -hmm. her behavior because the question is when did she ask the question yeah so i asked her to wait to ask any elaboration i mean the clarification questions until they com sort of complete and complete their description so that i, I did ask and that. did she always ask for an elaboration um almost but if it's already quite elaborate she didn't so you're biasing your sample. Mm, but I want it to be natural too. If one has <laughs> already provided very elaborate description, it's kind of uh, may, might make them a bit uncomfortable. It's kind of. Uh, uh, but anyway, yeah. So if it's already quite elaborate, then uh, she didn't ask any further questions. Yeah. So you're biasing the sample. Mm. That's a problem. Not so sure, but. Uh, well, if you have yeah. two chances to use something, yeah. or if you only have one, yeah. so if you have your superior people who yeah. are not even asked for more, then it's not surprising. Yeah, but you can always look at the first description only, and yeah. uh, there are two. I mean, there's a, a, yeah, we, we, you can do that. So yeah, yeah. So that's why the second one is problematic. The second one can be problematic. Yeah. So yeah, for for the when we talk about if frequency, yeah. Yeah, exactly. when we talk about yeah, think about uh, you know examine frequency. Yes, that's why we um, yeah. So when we are only interested in frequency, I think. But uh, but I thought in terms of the you know accompaniment of gesture, I thought we can look at both uh, second uh, first attempt and the second attempt. So that's do you think that gesture would also be different? It, it's uh, uh, if. Uh, the gesture that uh, accompany the first description and uh, you know and uh, and the gesture that accompany the mimetics that the l2 speakers used after they were asked to elaborate do you think that's different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe possibly mm -hmm. yeah because one of the biggest questions mm -hmm. is like why are you looking at gesture mm -hmm. right so one is you know the question you're asking in mm -hmm. this question is is about you mm -hmm. know do you gesture or not but what does it mean Right. So the interesting part about it is what what is the cognitive implication for it, and not just so if you have a gesture or not. So why is this relevant? Why do we care about this? And why do we not? So is it in terms of learning that it helps or that it distracts? So is it cognitively being processed as a with the the sensory thing that should make it yeah, easier that's, because there's an iconic yeah thing that that's that's uh, yeah. That's the assumption, but uh, yeah. Or is it the other way around, right? I think, no, yeah, I, I, I yeah but know. different, know, but different that, possibilities, for, especially for second language speakers. Right, yeah, so then yeah. the hypothesis need to predict systematically <laughs> what it would do for the speakers of one or the other, and this is why the within speaker comparison is important to their L1s. Mm. So, we, uh, so yeah. for example, when you yeah. have the English speaker, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and the English speaker in the first attempt mm -hmm. doesn't use one, and in the second attempt uses one, 
one of the things is so one of the th question is the compensatory nature of gesture and we know from the L2 mm -hmm. studies or from disfluency mm -hmm. studies that actually gesture is not compensatory mm -hmm. right compensatorily used in terms of using more iconics yes they gesture sometimes more mm -hmm. but they're not using more iconics right so what from the data that you showed the interesting part was that mm -hmm. it was always just a manner gesture and not a manner path Mm, that's true. For the English speakers, you would expect a manner path conflated one. Uh, so mm -hmm. th when it comes to the yeah, influence yeah. of the L1. Yeah. Actually, English speakers did not use so much conflation, manner of conflation. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Because they there was would, lots they of would... separate one. Uh huh, that's and, what I saw. And also, clear. only path. Mm -hmm. Goro goro. Goro goro or something like that. So mana conflation is something like this, going rolling down. But uh, Japanese speakers are said to do uh, koroga, korogatte ikimashita or something like that. And uh, and uh, so, yeah, th those English speakers did not use mana uh, path conflation much. So that was interesting to, to us too. I mean, number is small, but yes. I, this is a key yeah. conversation that could probably go on for yeah. hours yeah. between us. Um, is there anyone else? Any more questions? Um, with your interviews, mm -hmm. did you ask, or do you have any data on what their motivation for learning Japanese is? For the students? I'm students. I think so, but I have to. I, I was too busy looking at this, <laughs> and I haven't read the a transcript of the, the data so much, but I, I, I think so. I think I did. So primarily from an institution, like university students. Yes, they are all university. Well, not all, but mostly university students. Yeah. In, in Korea, uh, Korean speakers are all university students. Okay. In, here, the English speakers, mostly university students. Yeah. Yes? And um, also on slide 19, you showed Japanese and Korean Okay, so yeah, yeah. I was wondering um, whether there was an influence because I don't know much about influence of what the influence of one language to the other. I think yeah, yeah. Think so you yeah. think it's a known. Yes, actually, um, I said that the Korean speakers used a lot of mimetics for rolling event, and in Korean there's tegul tegul, yeah. right? So that's a bit like kuru kuru, don't you think? But do, do you think? Do you think? Do you think it's similar? <laughs> but anyway, I'm not a mimetic. But anyway, so that's one. The other thing that Korean speakers used a lot is chu chu. My pronunciation is not so good, obvious. <laughs> all the way, go up all, chu, chu, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so, uh, Korean, and so in Japanese, there's a similar uh, element, zutto. So Korean speakers use a lot of zutto. Zutto, zutto. Chu, chu. <laughs> so the meaning is similar, and, and uh, you see that form is slightly similar. Zutto, chu, chu. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say that there was a historical meaning to the Korean language. Yeah, yeah. Ah, historical link. I don't know about historical link. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think we better finish. It's uh, we're six, seven minutes over the time. So let us thank Noriko. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.